Um, next, we're going to have uh, Russ Jones uh, from Spectra Lab come up and talk to us about uh, concentrating uh, con uh, concentrated photovoltaics. Great. Thank you. What do I do for it? Just use the arrow keys? Uh, yes. I want to thank you for the invitation to speak here today, and this is uh, shaping up to be a very interesting. Um, the first session was very interesting, and I, I thought uh, Linda said a lot of things that uh, um, prompted me with some ideas of uh, things that I'd like to say uh, during my presentation, one of which is just that um, uh, you gave a couple of examples of uh, concentrating solar power and uh, the interest there. And it's interesting to see all the different things that can be done with concentrating solar energy. Usually it is uh, to generate heat. In the case of concentrating photovoltaics, we're actually trying to, we, we work pretty hard to make sure the solar cells don't get really hot when you do that. But we get a lot of benefits from concentration both in efficiency and in scalability. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, first, before I... Uh, uh, get into my talk. I just want to give a little background about Spectralab. Um, we, uh, we're a, an actual solar manufacturer operating right here in Los Angeles. And uh, in fact, I think we're the oldest solar manufacturer in the world, even older than me. And uh, uh, we, uh, we started out, you know, the, the solar cell PN junction was first demonstrated in 1953, and we were founded in 1956. So it wasn't too long after that. And the real uh, business was around spacecraft, and we have been the leading supplier of solar panels for spacecraft uh, for pretty much our entire history. Uh, we were part of the Hughes Aircraft Company uh, for 25 years, starting in, in 75. And uh, when um, Hughes Space and Communications was sold to Boeing, then we became a uh, subsidiary of Boeing, which we are now. So uh, we're, we're in Silmar, California, up at the north end of the valley, and uh, we do manufacture all of our solar cells right there in Silmar. And um, um, there's a little bit of information about our uh, total volume to date. We've made more than 3 million uh, multi-junction space cells for spacecraft and more than 10 million for CPV. That would sound like we've made more CPV, but the solar cells are much larger for the space. That would be roughly equivalent to 75 million CPV cells if they were the same size. So in fact, that's enough solar cells uh, to be more than a gigawatt of capacity if it was all on the ground. Um, so um, renewable energy, I, I think actually I wanted to just introduce the, an idea that um, the, the world uh, energy system has been driven for the hundreds of years leading up to today. Uh, and it's changing now with the paradigm that it was cheaper to uh, throw energy away than to be efficient. Um, and so uh, there's never been a whole lot of emphasis in the energy industry on secondary recovery and so on until uh, recent years, and that's driven by uh, both rising fuel costs uh, but even more so on climate change. And so I think the paradigm in the future is that the efficiency of uh, energy systems is important in its own right, and not just uh, and not just for cost, but it is also becoming an important cost driver in systems. And um, this is um, just to give you a little context of uh, concentrating photovoltaics. So, in concentrating solar power, uh, what's usually referred to as CSP you're concentrating sunlight in order to generate heat to spin a turbine. Uh, in concentrating photovoltaics, we're concentrating sunlight to basically reduce the cost of the semiconductors. And uh, for a long time, there was a great interest in doing this for silicon solar cells uh, because silicon solar cells were very expensive 20 years ago. And uh, the technology really kind of developed around that, but as the prices of silicon uh, came down, and as the uh, efficient, these very high efficiency multi-junction cell materials emerged, uh, the whole industry, for the most part, is shifting over to the high concentration systems like what's shown on the bottom. And uh, I also 
wanted to sort of con contrast this. Uh, um, Linda mentioned uh, water requirements as part of the sustainability question. And I, let me just talk about sustainability in general with regard to CPV. Um, uh, concentrating solar power that are thermal systems do require a lot of water. The only water required for a CPV system is to wash the windows occasionally. And so if it rains, uh, you don't even need that. Uh, it's probably one ten thousandth as much water required to uh, get equivalent power from a CPV system. And in terms of scalability, uh, what you can see there is that um, it's mirrors uh, or Fresnel lenses, uh, what's usually used as the concentrating element, glass, steel. These are things that are industrial materials that are already made in very large quantities. So the impact to scale up CPV in terms of industrial infrastructure is pretty low. Uh, the solar cells themselves, of course, that's, that's, uh, that's new technology, and that is something that's being scaled up, but you're using one one-thousandth or so of the amount of material. Uh, so um, actually, they're most, mostly fairly abundant materials, as well as you're using so much less of it because of the concentration uh, that it, I think it has a very good sustainability story as far as solar power technologies go. Um, it was also mentioned that uh, CSP uh, or solar in general, of course, uh, solar is m less expensive when there's more sunlight because it's uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. There's more kilowatt hours where it's sunny, obviously. Uh, it just so happens that uh, concentrating photovoltaics is most uh, competitive. It uses the direct sunlight resource and doesn't use the sort of the diffuse component of it. Uh, so it is definitely more competitive in places that are very high sun. That happens to be the best places to build solar in general. So uh, if you look at the, the growth rates in the solar industry today, uh, the, the growth rates in these high sun areas, as, as uh, subsidies are declining, you know, Germany was a huge growth market, but that was completely government driven. As those subsidies are going away, you see that the solar markets are really migrating to places where there's a good sun resource. And so uh, uh, CPV is an emerging technology, but it seems to be emerging just at the right time uh, in order to, uh, to go after this high growth uh, opportunity in the high sun areas. And I love to see that uh, we're both using the same charts. <laughs> uh, it's interesting to me when I look at this that most of those curves are very flat. And I, I don't want to even mention when I was in graduate school, but uh, uh, the whole picture has really shifted a lot upward since when I was in college. Um, and I think it's interesting when you look at this, there's really only two curves that have a significant upward trend. And one of them is organic down there, although they're starting from a very low baseline. The, their uh, efficiency gains are quite remarkable. But we are in that purple regime up there, and uh, I would say Spectral Lab has been right in the, in the forefront of the development of this technology along with NREL and Fraunhofer and uh, a couple of other uh, competitors here. And it's been mostly a U.S. play as well, uh, so um, uh, kind of proud of that. And uh, you see that the technology is up above 40% now. There are people that are making module efficiencies that are above 30% today, and uh, they'll be more than 33% in a few years. So that's another part of the sustainability and the, um, the cost competitiveness of, of uh, CPV. When you look at the cost of solar power systems in general, uh, the module prices are going down, 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 but uh, there's still a lot of cost in, in the labor of installation, and uh, it's a lot harder to drive that cost out. So when you have three times as much power per square meter of aperture, uh, you have a, a lot of leverage on that uh, with a CPV-type system. And uh, uh, so anyway, uh, that's one of the key reasons why we think this is a very uh, viable technology for the near future. Um, it just kind of, uh, Joshua challenged me to say uh, something about the, uh, the future of the technology. I, I do think that this is an area of real low-hanging fruit uh, because um, if you look at in the, the details of all those record efficiencies on the previous chart, uh, 
three of the record efficiencies are all different vectors on the same basic technology. So uh, before I sort of delve into that, I just want to talk about what the fundamental loss mechanisms are in a, in a solar cell. Um, there's essentially three. You have a, you have a band gap in the semiconductor, and uh, you get the ideal conversion efficiency when you illuminate that with light that's equal to the band gap. So there's just enough energy to excite electrons across the band gap and collect those as current. Uh, so if you have light that is not energetic enough, it can't excite electrons across the band gap. That's lost energy. But conversely, if you have light that is greater than that band gap, then it's the waste, the extra energy just thermalizes as the, as the electrons decay back down to the band edge. So that's an energy loss too. And if you, you know, if you look at uh, the efficiency of a single junction solar cell and, and, and compare that to the solar spectrum that we have from our sun, uh, it turns out that gallium arsenide, cadmium telluride have, happen to have just the right band gap. Silicon is a little off uh, the ideal band gap um, that balances those two losses. Uh, what we do in the multi-junction world is we're stacking several solar cells on top of each other and they all have different band gaps and all have different optimum wavelengths and you stack them so that what's not absorbed by the first cell is absorbed by the second and then the third. Uh, so you're, you're essentially eliminating thermalization loss and, uh, and the uh, loss of non-absorption by doing that. Um, the third loss there is, uh, is a little harder to explain, but uh, it's called quasi-Fermi level splitting. Essentially, uh, you don't get a voltage equal to the band gap when you illuminate the cell, you get something less. And uh, that's really the voltage you can extract. But when you increase the intensity of sunlight on the cell, you get, as the minority carrier concentration gets larger, you get uh, a voltage that's closer to the band gap. And that's actually why solar cells improve under concentration. And in fact, the cells that we make that are 40% average production efficiency under concentration would be about 31% maybe without concentration. So there's a big gain, and this would be true for all PN junction devices, but uh, uh, there's a big gain from concentrating sunlight. So the, the technology today uh, is uh, either lattice-matched or metamorphic. We've, we've produced multiple generations of the lattice-matched solar cells. So these, are, these cells are grown as quite high-quality semiconductor crystals. And we start with a germanium substrate, and then we grow a gallon. We actually make a germanium solar cell from that substrate, and then we grow a gallium arsenide cell on top of that, and a gallium indium phosphide cell on top of that. And those materials are chosen specifically because they can be grown to have exactly the same lattice constant as the germanium. And uh, uh, the challenge has been to, f uh, and I would say the challenge in general is either to add more junctions or to find ways to manipulate the lattice constants to still maintain very high crystal quality uh, while manipulating the band gaps so that they better match the solar spectrum and extract more energy from the solar spectrum. Uh, so we have started making the first metamorphic solar cell uh, in which we have deliberately shifted the uh, lattice constant between the growth substrate of germanium and the upper two cells by having a series of step-graded buffer layers that encapsulate the uh, inherent crystal defects that are created from not having a, lat a matching lattice. And uh, we shift the band gaps of the top two cells down a little bit, which matches the spectrum better, and that's actually how we've achieved 40% uh, production efficiency. Uh, we keep improving the lattice match cells, too, uh, through just better wafer processing, so that's actually gotten up to 39.5% efficiency now as well. So, so where do we go from there? Um, there's lots of opportunities actually still for making better lattice matched solar cells. Okay. And uh, uh, so we have work going on on three, four, and five junction solar cells. The challenge is making that intermediate cell that uh, 
uh, is in the uh, one electron volt uh, band gap range. And uh, we've got a couple of programs going on with that. Uh, another approach is to actually grow the cells upside down. And uh, for some arcane reasons, it's actually uh, easier in some ways to do that. Uh, and so it's called inverted metamorphic. You grow it upside down, and then you have to have a way to remove the epitaxial layer from the growth substrate and then process it that way. Uh, just, just to touch briefly on the growth technology, uh, we use uh, what's called MOVPE or metallo-organic vapor phase epitaxy. It's basically uh, the, the reactant materials are flown o over, the, um, over the growth substrate uh, suspended with, an, with a light organic molecule, uh, and we can get extremely precise deposition rates and compositions from that technology. So I just want to give one example of how this is really, uh, has really reawakened the whole field of concentrator photovoltaics. What you see here actually is a system out in Australia, and the ones on the left had silicon modules in them, and they replaced the ones on the right with multi-junction modules. Uh, nothing else about the system changed, but they got 56 percent more power from their system by doing that, and they probably raised the price of the system by 10 percent or so, but all the other investment, the investment in the mirrors and the poles and the wiring and everything else is all leveraged by that higher efficiency of the solar cells. So uh, this company and other companies that are kind of prominent in this field that were doing silicon cells before have totally switched what they're doing, and it's all multi-junction now. So. Um, so I guess uh, final chart in conclusion, uh, the ability to manipulate the band gaps can improve the uh, matching to the spectrum and improve the efficiency, and uh, these metamorphic cells open the palette further, but there's lots of opportunities with lattice match cells. Uh, there's five different devices that have all demonstrated uh, performance over 41 percent today, so I think what it's demonstrated is that there's just a rich target field here of, of ways to improve the efficiencies. And uh, p most technologists in our industry believe that 50% is achievable. I think we'll, we'll hit 45% within five years, and there's a good chance of 50% within 10 years in this technology area. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Russ.